are still loading in. Uh, welcome to this programme launch of the Digital Future of Manufacturing Ecosystems. Uh, my name is Charlotte Horobin. I'm the Region Director across the Midlands and the East of England uh, for Make UK, which is the national body that represents UK manufacturers. I've also got uh, the role of chairing the Strategic Advisory Board, though, for the Intrap programme. So uh, it's a delight to be, to be leading and chairing this session today. Now, after two years of COVID, I'm sure that we don't need to press these points, but just a little bit of webinar etiquette to uh, make sure that we are all well behaved. Um, so can I just um, remind you that this session is being recorded um, and the slides will be available after the event if you want to circulate those um, amongst your network. We'd encourage you to be interactive. We, we want you to be here to be curious, to be thought provoking, to be challenging. So please uh, make sure you do engage. And also, um, I'd love to hear your questions coming through throughout the session. So please do pop them through the chat. Um, we will have a Q&A towards the end of the session. Fingers crossed as long as our speakers keep to time. Um, and if you'd like to um, pose those live, then we'll be able to take your questions within the latter part of the session. So today's agenda uh, will shortly be handing over to Professor Delma Dwight. Delma for me is the oracle of uh, Midlands data. Delma knows everything that's going on within the region. So Delma will be taking us through the role of manufacturing in the Midlands. We'll then be uh, heading over to Dr. Francis Zhang, who will be covering the manufacturing capabilities in the Midlands and the great research that the team at Loughborough University have already uh, gathered. And then we'll hand over to Professor Jan Godsell, again from Loughborough University, who will be covering the digital future of manufacturing uh, ecosystems. Jan, for me, is the world leader in terms of supply chain operations knowledge. So you have got three brilliant speakers to listen to over the next uh, 50 minutes. We will then conclude for a 10 minute session where we'd like to uh, hear your thoughts, curiosities, your questions. Yeah. So please do keep them in mind. So without any further ado, it's my uh, pleasure to hand over to Delma, uh, to Delma to set the scene for us. Delma, good afternoon. Excellent. Many thanks, Charlotte. And it's great to see so many of you here today. I'd just like to really very briefly uh, set the scene, set out the really vital role that we all know that manufacturing sector plays um, in the Midlands economy um, and look at where some of the potential future growth opportunities are. So if we move on to the first slide here, you can see, um, you know, the Midlands engine is the biggest regional economy outside London and the southeast. It trans you know, it goes across 65 local authority areas, generates nearly £246 billion pounds in gross value added. So that's 15% of the England's total. And we know that £40 billion pounds of that comes alone from manufacturing. So that accounts for 16% of the region's economy compared to only 9.5% in the UK overall. So it's a really critical sector in terms of the business base um, and the jobs it provides to people. We have over half a million people um, working in the sector. So 20% of all the UK sector jobs are employed here in the Midlands. And critically, the export potential of these Midlands companies over a one in five of all UK exports come from the Midlands companies, and this is driven largely by manufacturing exports. So across these 25,000 manufacturing businesses that all operate at very high levels of productivity, um, home to some of the world's leaders, leading manufacturers, we have national and international significant strengths in health and life sciences, aerospace, agri-tech, automotive and transport, ceramics, heating and energy generation, and much more. Uh, it's not just those narrow definitions of what manufacturing is uh, traditionally seen. So how we can continue to power the people and unlock that productivity for growth and prosperity is really key. Because we know, and as Jan will set out, underpinning all of these is the sort of unique and internet interconnected supply chains that form this network of companies that all work together across the Midlands in really innovative ways to manufacture products for our everyday use. 
Um, if we look at the next slide here, you can see some of the what's in that what the sort of future opportunities are and what the potential impact that could have on the Midlands engine. Uh, we know that the changes will be provided by these major economic shifts. We know digitization and the transition to a green economy um, will be fundamental in the transformation of the sector. So how the sector can adapt to these changes to maintain the region's capabilities and economic contributions is really key. Um, across all our subsectors, there's already some great examples of how the sector is already adapting. We know, for example, there's the decarbonisation of transport is already occurring in rail and aerospace. Uh, with regard to aerospace, there's work ongoing looking at sustainable aviation fuel, lightweighting, new propulsion systems, uh, light and very light rail, as well as digital rail systems will create that cleaner, more efficient and safer rail transport. Likewise, digitisation is obviously a key opportunity. The integrating sensors, satellite, autonomous vehicles and drones, as well as automated production lines. Uh, we know that at Harper Adams and Lincoln Universities are already developing and implementing those technologies. So those opportunities for a quicker production, less waste and greater position. Um, so all those sensors that you see now in food packaging that can help reduce waste and give in accurate indications um, of when food is edible. So there is a huge potential there. The prize in terms of capitalising on those opportunities could create some 165,000 jobs and generate an additional £14 billion pounds in GVA for the engine. Um, so we know that the business sector are facing many challenges at the moment, but we feel that the potential opportunity is there if we can grasp those opportunities. So I'll hand over to Francis now from Loughborough University, who will share with you some of the details of the primary research that they've been conducting with the business base. Thank you. Thank you, Delma. So hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, in the next 20 minutes, I will share with you some of the interesting findings from our recent survey focusing on mapping the current state of manufacturing capability in the Midlands based on 103 um, responses from the region. So um, in the survey, we actually focus on the three topics the manufacturing capability at the different levels from the sector to supply chain and then within the single firm. And then we look at the green growth, um, which is very important the sustainability um, aspect because um, it's important for the firms to um, actually support the UK net zero agenda. And then lastly, we look at the industrial digital technology adoption um, in the region because our recent study with Blue Yanda actually shows that the digital technologies are a very critical enabler to build uh, sustainable manufacturing supply chains in the future. So before, um, before we look at the main findings, just to quickly show you who was engaged in the survey. Um, our sample actually includes uh, manufacturing firms across both regions and also different sectors, as you can see in the figure. If we just take a detailed look, actually the sample um, companies um, are a very good representation of the key manufacturing elements in both East and West Midlands, um, comparing with the, the Make UK figure. And then we have um, all sorts of people from senior management team across the diverse business functions. So um, the responses actually formed a very comprehensive view for us to understand the broad picture. And then um, we're moving on to the main findings. Um, first of all, I want to um, show you the insights um, from the sector and the supply chain level. So, OK, so then we try to map the role of the regional firms in a typical manufacturing supply chain, as you can see in the figure. Interestingly, most of the firms actually said they are heavily engaged in the value adding activities, i.e. making products in the region, but not very much in the raw material supply and distribution. We also have um, other data in our survey showing that the regional firms are tend to um, tend to source from the wider UK rather than purchasing from the um, low, local um, suppliers. And then we did a cross um, sector capability mapping and our results showing that there are four sectors are able to serve more customers if there's a real market demand. 
So um, this slide looks a bit complex, but if we just take a closer look, it's actually the detailed capability mapping in a matrix table format. So the second column shows the home sector of the surveyed firms, and the second row shows the sector that firms are able to serve. And then in the middle, we use the color code to show the potential gap between the market that the firms are currently serving and also the total percentage that they are able to serve if there are real demand. So the darker the color, the bigger the gap. This is how we identify the four sectors. Here I'm going to use a li little laser pen. As you can see, the aerospace and automotive sectors and also the um, electronics and also the, um, the industrial equipment. And the last one is the um, non-metallic sectors. They have a larger room to grow. Um, considering the time, I'm not going into too much details, but if you are interested, we will share the slides after the webinar so you can have a look. And then moving on to the firm level insights. Um, we first investigated the level of production capacity utilization uh, within the single firm. And um, on the left hand, roughly we can see 50% uh, of the firms are operating at the level of 85% or lower, which is not operationally sustainable. And there are 71% firms actually said um, they are able to increase the utilization rate if they could address some of the issues showing on the bottom right, such as shortage of labor, shortage of material, and also low market demand. I think this is a good re reflection of some of the supply chain crisis we've been seeing during the COVID-19 um, situation. And then we, we look at the capability from two perspectives. First, this technological perspective, and then we, we will move on to the managerial perspective. So regarding the technological capability, here's the prediction of manufacturing technology adoption in 2026. So the figure on the top of each bar shows the total of the current um, adoption rate showing in the solid color and the planned adoption rate for the next five years, which is um, in a slight trans um, transparent color. So the key conclusion here is that high value manufacturing sectors such as the construction, industrial equipment and the electronics actually have a very strong intention in building their technological capability in the next five years. And I believe the driver behind this is to fulfill their um, um, dynamic customer demands um, with uh, more innovative products. And then moving on to the managerial capability, we look at it from three um, perspectives. In the pre-production um, phase, the R&D capability becomes the focus in the next five years, according to the company's responses here because this, this area is currently, um, the development in this area is currently lagging behind compared with uh, talent acquisition and adaptability. So this supports the findings that we just saw in the last slide that companies are more likely to, um, to upgrade their um, um, technological capability in the next five years. So it aligns with, with their R&D um, activity. And then moving on to the next phase, which is the production. Firms are quite struggling with the buffer management, typically the production capacity and inventory management. Um, we also found the same issues in our company-based case studies. So OEMs and the lower tiers, lower tier suppliers are really struggling to cope with the fluctuated demand signals due to poor visibility and the supply chain planning practices. Um, when they actually manage the end-to-end -end supply chains. And then moving on to um, the last phase, the post-production phase, we all know inventory comes with costs, but how can we actually optimize the inventory is something that many firms are really, really struggle under the current situation. Again, from our um, company-based case study, we found that actually OEMs face inventory management crisis at the moment. As some of the industrial customers want just-in-time delivery, but despite the fact that they, they keep changing the quantity and the delivery time of the order on short notice. 
So in this case, the OEMs are very likely to have a lot of finished products sitting in the warehouse and waiting for the delivery. And it's all costs. And after, um, after the manufacturing capability part, we're moving on to the green growth. And as I just mentioned, it's a very important part because firms are, are facing the, the forthcoming and net zero goal deadline. So we first look at the drivers of the green growth, um, which, which we identified that there are top three drivers, including creating competitive advantage, responding to the legislation, and the catching up with competitors. So with the net zero agenda in mind, now more and more companies actually um, are trying to assess the sustainability um, of itself, but also their suppliers in the supply chain. And then we move on to understand what are the current practices adoption in the in the current uh, in the current situation. So we look at the, the green growth um, practice and also the resource efficiency practice. So as we can see, look at the current state, most of firms have adopted the practices at the firm level. However, if we look at the trend for the next five years, we can see that the focus will be shifted towards the supply chain level as highlighted in the in the green boxes. So more firms will assess again, as I just mentioned, the sustainability of their suppliers. They will audit the carbon footprint embedded within their supply chain. And also they, they will buy um, stuff from local suppliers to probably to reduce the, the carbon footprint caused by uh, produced by the transportation and also utilize the recycled content to be uh, more sustainable in, in the long term. OK, so that's an overview of the green growth in the region. And last part is more about um, industrial digital technology, the IDT adoption. So the fact that drive the IDT adoption, including the cost of savings and again retain and competitiveness and stay in the competition. So this is because many firms are now realized the value of data. As they um, the value actually the data actually can help um, the firm to make the decisions better and also to monitor the operational efficiency. More importantly, if the firms could use the data gathered from the end-to-end -end supply chains, they could take a more um, proactive um, approach to identify the issues in um, in advance and also managing the operations. This also um, well explain the trends on the right hand side. So more firms are planning to upgrade their IDT capability from simply and uh, the top three, uh, uh, top two, um, the prediction, the planning prediction, and also tracking products to more um, advanced analytics and also simulation and build better connectivity. Okay, and moving on to the technology adoption figure you can see the predicted adoption rate of the idts in the next five years which is quite interesting to see that the sections um sorry the factor sorry um let me just is jumping around on my screen so the sectors with higher adoption with higher current adoption rate actually prefers to keep the trend as you can see the the, the size of the bar of the of the solid bar underneath actually is quite equivalent to the transparent bar on the above. So that's a that's a signal that more um, companies will be accelerating their digital um, journey in the next five years to keep up the trend. And then, OK, we try to understand whether the IDT adoption and the potential growth rate of each market whether is there any uh, link between the two? And the answer is yes, because the blue and the green bar underneath actually shows the aggregated data derived from our cross-sector capability ma mapping activity. If you remember before, we have a quite complex slide. And we can clearly see that the sector with a high um, growth potential, for example, if I just pointed, for example, here, they have the high um, growth potential. They actually have also have a, also have a 
high percentage adoption rate planned in the next five years. And then this is the um, probably the last slide of my section, yes. And this brings us to the conclusion of my section, and I prepared five insights for you to take away. So um, first of all, um, based on the capability mapping we did, I think it is important to think about how can we actually increase the manufacturing content in the region. It's not simply um, making more products in the region, but also sourcing more from the local um, suppliers. This will contribute to the productivity growth in the region, as Delma mentioned but also address some of the sustainability issues in the supply chain, um, such as uh, remove CO2 emissions from the transportation. And also um, we can try to use the stuff um, in the current business systems rather than mining from the underground. And then the second point is we all know nowadays it's supply chains compete, not individual firms. So Addressing the supply chain issues, as, as we saw in the previous slides, such as the buffer management, um, is very important to, to, for the firms to stay in the competition, because if the buffer is too big, um, actually the, the firms are, are cash constrained, but, but the firm, if the buffer is too small, actually the firm may fail to deliver the products to their end customers, because they don't have any goods in the, in the inventory. And then um, the same mindset actually apply to the sustainability issues. Sustainability is not um, any single responses, uh, responsibility of any single firm. Um, it's, um, it's for all of the firms involved in the supply chain. So we, we urge the firms to take a more collaborative, collaborative approach in supporting the net zero um, agenda. And um, the, fourth, the fourth point, we are all in the digital era, so upgrading digital capability is uh, is one of the top priority for the firms to be operationally productive and also resilient and sustainable. And coming to the very last point, so I think it's a um, it's a very good time to think about the future. So what what's next? Now I will pass it on to Jen to talk about our new research program the digital future of manufacturing ecosystems. Over to you, Jan. Thanks. Thanks. Um, um, Francis. Let me just check if Francis mutes, I think we'll lose the echo. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for attending. Um, funnily enough, I was perhaps more reflective. I did quite a number of webinars and chats and things. Um, but actually, I was much more reflective in, pre in preparing for this presentation. And I think it's because of the magnitude of the situation that we find ourselves in. I've had a passion for manufacturing since I was 15. It drove the degree I did. It drove my studies and travels to Japan. It's um, been at the heart of all of my career development and moving from industry into academia. But never have I felt more in, um, in my lifetime that we have an opportunity to sit and reflect and perhaps put in train um, a future of our manufacturing ecosystem that will help us address um, a broader set of challenges than perhaps um, what our supply chains and our manufacturing ecosystems have delivered in the past. And I think as the, as the UK, we've seen perhaps some disruptions around Brexit, though actually Brexit planning probably helped us to prepare for COVID. But then post COVID, we've perhaps seen a whole different set of challenges um, that we've been faced, partic particularly on the supply side um, by the invasion of Ukraine. And you could argue, are these things we could have predicted? Perhaps not, but maybe if we think about how supply chains could be affected, we could have scenario planned for that. But whilst supply chains are front and foremost in many people's minds, I think it's a real opportunity for us to sit and reflect, but also think as we move forward, how we might work together to address this. So in my reflective mode, I'm going to first of all start by actually looking a little bit to the past and what we can maybe learn from that. But then what we need to consider for the future and then last but not least, and most importantly, um, 
perhaps it's a call for all of us then to think about how we can deliver the digital future that we want. Um, because I think there's an old adage that says um, you need to create the future that you want. And we can't do that individually, but each and every one of us on this webinar, and if we were to reach out into our networks and to inspire our networks together, we might be able to create that future that we want. So what can we learn from the past or what have I reflected on my past? So as I said, I have been in the manufacturing or wanted to since I was 15, but I started when I was 18, when I was sponsored from school by ICI. You have to be of a certain age to know who ICI is and some of our younger members may need to Google them. But ICI was one of the largest manufacturing conglomerates in the world. Certainly it was the largest um, employer in the UK after the civil service. And at the time in the late 1980s, it was very vertically integrated. It did practically everything itself, including generation of its own power, which wasn't because it wanted to produce its own electricity, but actually electricity was a byproduct of steam production, which it needed for the chemical processes. The other thing we shouldn't forget is back in the 1980s, it was still highly automated process control, but it was hardwired. So it didn't have the internet, but it used cables. And also it had really good connectivity to inventory visibility at some of its suppliers, but used phone lines and telematics again, rather than the Internet. And it also had a digital backbone, albeit MRP2. I actually found my old MRP2 leaflet or brochure or training manual. I don't know how you describe it the other day. It was a real blast from the past. But also ICI had really strong links to the community. Every Friday night we'd go to the ICI social club to have a cheap beer. Um, but there was very much a sense of community around the sites where it was um, fixed. But also they had an invest, uh, uh, immense investment in talent. I was sponsored from school. I did a pre-university year. It was exemplary. I started at the same time as the apprentices. We did the same first three months of training together. And this was the days before PowerPoint when someone basically put up a board to show you that whether you took an apprenticeship route or going to university route, we all ended up in the same place. It was just what it was just the route that we preferred to do, but we had exactly the same opportunity. I wouldn't have gone to Japan if it wasn't for ICI because they gave me training every vacation. I registered for my MPDS, my Monitor Professional Development Scheme with the IMEC -E when I was 18. I was chartered by the time I was 27. Um, and I've never been on so many training courses from new age thinking to transcendental meditation to German speaking because they really invested in their talent. And without that investment in talent, I wouldn't have been able to move on to then work for what was a scale up in the late 1990s, a company called Dyson. And it was when I moved to Dyson, that I recognised, although I wanted to make factories better, it wasn't going to help them. And actually Dyson, in some respects, faced the challenge that many organisations now are facing as a result of the invasion of Ukraine. We've moved perhaps from some of the demand instability um, that COVID caused to some supply instability that we now see as a result of um, um, resource scarcity and shortage. You imagine you're a scale up that has a product that just about everyone in the world wants. You've got both demand variability because all of your customers are saying they want more than they actually want just to try and get what they actually need. And you've got a supply base that's struggling to catch up. And it was that reality that made me realise, although I was employed and I did design the production line for this very vacuum cleaner, the DCO3, sounds much grander than what it actually is. Um, the production line was actually quite basic, but hey ho, it sounds grand. Actually, that wasn't going to help Dyson grow. In order to help Dyson grow, you needed to take that end to end perspective. And what we needed to do was to understand true consumer demand, <laughs> not our customers, because they were all um, panic buying and asking for more than they actually needed, because we needed to make sure that every week every consumer got the vacuum that they needed. Um, and we needed to try to understand how we could get a more honest demand signal from our customers. But we also needed to work with our suppliers to, to understand how we could increase their supply. And actually some of this, I can remember going out to a supplier in, um, in Italy that was struggling. And essentially they were struggling because all their customers were demanding um, stuff. And so they kept changing their production line to whoever was shouting loudest. And what they realised was they had all these unnecessary changeovers. So the company said for one month, we're going to set up a product wheel just to get some stability back into our manufacturing process. 
And actually product wheels are a very forgotten about technique for basically helping you to manage base your uh, scheduling in a much more um, controlled way, because actually we get flexibility through stability. But also part of the way we managed to increase our supply base was actually by developing in-house capability. Something like 65% of the Dyson is injection molded plastic and Dyson had very little knowledge of the uh, ec ec the economics of injection molding, but by developing an own in-house mold shop, didn't take away all of the demand, just part of it at a time when we were supply constrained. We actually learnt better how to manage our supply base because we had some knowledge of how of the both the economics and process of inj injection molding. But also, when we first started off injection molding, we didn't have any robots, and so we had people taking the parts on and off. And very quickly, we realised how we could actually increase supply through appropriate automation and how that could also help us therefore grow our supply base, which could help us grow the company. But also we began to realise vulnerabilities in our supply base. Um, there was one part back then that there was a tiny little company in Accrington um, that produced a part that if that little tiny company in Accrington had decided, it, you know, either not to supply anymore or to close down, we, all of our vacuum cleaners would have been at risk. Um, and so it also made me realise the importance very early on about understanding your supply space and potential vulnerabilities. But one of the great things about a Dyson, um, I'm not sure this was necessarily intentional, the design was so modular, it was actually designed fully for repair. And in the early days of Dyson, um, all vacuum cleaners in the UK came back to Dyson to be repaired, and then they moved to a model of it actually being field based. But there was always a model that if you bought a Dyson, it could always be repaired. And there was two fixed prices for repair, depending on whether it was a motor repair or a non motor repair. And Dyson took perhaps a different attitude to talent. It was a fast growing company with an average age employee age of 27. So it had to empower its talent. So it had quite a, um, an innovative approach, which was we will give you the opportunity to succeed. If you succeed, we'll promote you. But if you don't succeed, maybe you might want to consider employment elsewhere. But actually, when you're 27 and ambitious, that's a fantastic model because it gives you the chance to really show your potential. And so what this really shows me is many of those principles I learned from both ICI and from Dyson, they still apply now. Um, Paul Shakespeare for the High Value Manufacturing Catapult did a study looking at skills across a number of countries around the world. And one of the things we need to remember, even if we want to digitise the fundamentals of manufacturing strategy and supply chain strategy, they have not changed. And so actually it's very, very important that as we look to the future and as we manage in the short term through our current crisis, that we use the basics of good manufacturing strategy and we use the basics of good supply chain strategy to ensure that we're making the right decisions. Because we do need to consider some different things for the future, but they should build on that solid base of those basics. Um, whether it be sunflower oil, whether it be semiconductors, we know that actually we are very supply constrained for certain different commodity groups. And whilst, for instance, we can pivot with sunflower oil to rapeseed oil, which is more domestically produced, if you're looking at something like rare, rare, rare earth metals, we don't have reserves of those in the ground. So if we want to become more resilient in the supply of those rare, rare earth metals, as Francis alluded to earlier, we may need to consider how we can get those from materials that are already in circulation. Because I think one thing that perhaps some of the recent disruptions have identified is that whether or not you're the UK or any other country around the world, there are certain things that you should be self-sufficient in the manufacture of to ensure that those things that are critical to life, we can always provide. Now, we might not be able to provide them in the full spectrum of variety that consumers in normal times would come to um, enjoy, but perhaps that is a privilege. But I think it is fair to say that there are certain things that we need to make sure that everybody in a country has access to at a price that they can afford so that we have a, a level and equitable society. And how we go about doing this and our approach to resilience may vary depending on the type of flexibility required. Now, those of you who may have heard me speak and um, for those of you interested, um, our area of expertise is around um, supply chain flexibility, around segmentation, around buffer management, but that's not what today's all about. 
But ultimately, if you think about much of what we saw during COVID from a sort of consumer product perspective was essentially what, what we need call demand flexibility, dynamic flexibility. So essentially, we've got network designs that are pretty much stay within their normal configuration, but we see either a, a demand or supply shock to which we can respond to, but the network design doesn't change. Our supply base stays the same, our customer base stays the same, but what we have to get very good at is using our buffer management, whether that be time, whether that be inventory or spare manufacturing capacity to help um, balance demand and supply. And what we saw during COVID, sometimes if our customers really aren't behaving, we might need to ration them. Um, what we saw some of the supermarkets doing because they actually knew that, you know, we weren't using more toilet roll. We just had to control the rate at which consumers were buying the toilet roll and try to get that more in line with the rate that consumers were using their toilet roll. However, we also saw during COVID demand for some things like PPE or ventilators come out of nowhere and suddenly we needed to create new supply chains, new network designs for things that we never needed to necessarily in the past because the demand surge was so great. And perhaps what we're now seeing um, with the invasion of Ukraine is that um, sources of supply have been taken out of our network. So therefore we're having to reconfigure our supply base to that or we're seeing a global resource constraint, for instance, semiconductors, where there's just been a huge, such a huge and unpredictable increase in demand. And actually when it's $27 billion investment in a wafer fab production facility, it's gonna take a while for, to be able to make that investment to catch up. And so we're having to see some different ways of operating. So these principles will stay and you need to ensure that your supply chains are both um, dynamically flexible, i.e. within a, a configuration you can manage it well, but equally that perhaps we're slightly better at thinking about structural flexibility and planning for this. And just remember whether or not you're looking for stru structural flexibility requires us to potentially have dormant nodes in our network. Um, and that comes at a cost, just as having buffers come at a cost. And maybe part of the reason why we've been slightly caught out is we've not wanted to pay the cost of resilience. Um, it's not necessarily we've leaned things out in terms of not wanted any inventory necessarily, but perhaps from a financial perspective, we've not necessarily factored in the cost of resilience. But however way you look at it, up until this point, all we've really thought about is the money. You know, if every stage of our industrial evolution up until this point has been about consumption driven economic growth. And actually, that is what the problem is. As we come into this next phase, we really need to think a little bit differently. Um, sometimes it really quite shocks me that, OK, we're now recognising it's not just about economic growth. Um, and now we're concerned about the environment. But you know what? Um, it's people. Uh, as profit planet people or people actually profit planets. We still think of people last. Our supply chains have huge inequities in them. Um, and that's not just that necessarily we're paying um, um, substantially lower than living wage type of wages to people in certain um, parts of the world, but actually even within the UK, we can have very dominant um, retailers or OEMs who actually have quite exploitative practices that put um, some of the farmers or um, manufacturers uh, under quite severe cost constraints. So that actually we end up with situations like a few years ago where we have farmers taking their cows into supermarkets because we're selling water at a higher, pro at a higher price than we are milk. Um, so this idea of equity needs to be thought about across the entire supply chain and we shouldn't just think about as a difference between perhaps more de um, developed countries or those that are on their journey of economic development. We actually still see that within our supply chains, even within um, the developed world. And so I think the real thing um, to respond to or to think about as we're going forward is that people profit planet mix. But also this idea in order to really address that, that can we really just pursue consumption driven economic growth going forward, i.e. we basically encourage people to buy more and more and more to support economic growth. We can't for two reasons. One, it's destroyed our planet, 
But two, it's not been good for our people. We've not necessarily created good work. We've not created necessarily a future of work that people want. But actually, not everybody can afford, as we can see now with the cost of living crisis, not everybody in our country can afford to buy all of the things that they need. This approach really isn't working and needs to change. And so for me, this really is our call for a different way to actually couple consumption and production. We have to think about um, a new way of operating that does still support economic growth, but also will ensure that everybody around the world gets access to the things that they need in a way that they can afford and that we um, are both responsible consumers as individuals, but responsible producers too. And there are business models out there that start to do this. So um, some of you may have heard me use this example before. It's just a very straightforward one of HP Instant Inc, where HP still sell their cartridges um, through normal retail challenge, ch uh, channels. So you can go to a supermarket and buy their ink. Um, but actually, if you're savvy, I really wouldn't recommend you do that because it's expensive. And the chances are when you actually need your printer to work, the ink will have dried up or have run out. Whereas with Instant Ink, a subscription service enabled by a tiny little bit of IoT in the printer cart or in the printer that uses the internet to let HP know um, what you've printed, um, how much ink you've got left, and when to send out your new cartridges, they've essentially developed a business model that is cheaper, um, gives you a better service, um, enables you to print colour black or white, guarantees you'll never run out of ink. But actually it's better for them and their supply chain because they have absolute visibility of demand which means they can absolutely plan supply but it also supports the principles of the circular economy because you're much more likely to send your ink cartridges back it's also enabled them to make their ink cartridges magic because they now know it's beneficial to basically give you as much ink as possible so that they don't have to so they can minimize their logistics costs and actually hp are really amazing example of an organization that's really put um, the principles of the circular economy at the heart of everything that they do it's at the core of their business strategy and also they're very very open about this so you can go onto their website and get many different materials that explain their um, circular economy journey and what you can essentially see is that they've got these three principles of designing for repair and reuse you know that's what dyson used to do um, they design for recycled content and they design out waste and pollution. And as you can see, that then underpins their different models around maintenance and upgrade, around products and services, around reuse and refurbishment, and materials recovery and reuse. Because some research that we did, um, actually it was when we were still at WMG in conjunction with Blue Yonder, um, actually showed that if we just looked at circular supply chain practices, we could create a really flourishing world by 2035. Um, and this is a world that is quite different, but it's underpinned by sustainable and circular economy practices. It's underpinned by digitization. It's underpinned by this altered consumption model, i.e. this decoupling of consumption and production. And it requires us to be much more collaborative. What it would mean if we were to think about it, particularly from a Midlands engine perspective, it probably means that we'd need to think about the Midlands as a factory rather than the Midlands as a region with lots of factories within it. And that actually we would be creating regional manufacturing hubs, both within Midlands Engine, but across the UK, and that we would be leveraging these closed loop models to help avoid some of these risks and resource price fluctuations that we've seen. And we, it would be enabled by digital transparency. But the benefit for manufacturing firms is that they'd start to enjoy increased profitability because we've broken this cycle of a sort of product cost model to actually be able to look at new more value added built customer value creation business models that have more attractive cost structures and could enable productivity gains and this is a world that's very very different um, some of you may have heard the term distributed manufacturing and what this essentially means at the moment we tend to think of our manufacturing being constrained within walls within factories but essentially just think that each machine on its own if it's iot enabled um, is a factory in its own right and every vehicle or, or or that we could use to move things is a is a it has the ability to connect those machines and so we can really start to think if you want to think really wacky maybe it's slightly beyond 2035 now i think in 2050 and beyond and it may not be for all products 
But let's think about our region as a factory where every machine is an independent entity, where every vehicle that can move things is an independent entity and we configure networks based on consumer demand. And each of those machines competes not on scale, but on scope could, if required, be make things that are fully customizable. Um, as I say, everything's distributed rather than centralized. And, and it's, an, it's possible because we have this high degree of connectivity. But also, it's also possible because um, it's helping us towards net zero because we've powered it through low carbon energy sources. And we're thinking about that carbon footprint in an integrated, not an individualistic way. It also is possible because unlike when we ran out of fuel last year, it wasn't because we didn't have fuel in the UK, it's because we couldn't get the fuel to where it needed to be. It's because we've integrated logistics and manufacturing together and we've taken the driver as responsible consumption, not around production, pushing it out and profit maximisation. And it's definitely enabled because we're thinking in circles, not in linear lines. And that this consideration of both the social and environmental impacts at the core of everything that we're doing. And actually, research has shown that the ways to achieve this, the two critical drivers, we identified 54 drivers and then did a clever cluster analysis to look at the two most dominant. And believe me, those two most dominant drivers are the adoption of industrial digital technologies and the improvement of supply chain integration, which actually does tend to be supported through um, supply chain planning platforms. So both require an investment in digital technologies. And actually, if you're going to think about your business, there's four aspects of your digital business you need to consider. You can use these digital technologies just to make your core supply chain processes better, be that planning, be that manufacturing, be that procurement or logistics. But if you're super smart, you'll use these technologies to create that end to end supply chain, to think about supply chain as a business process and optimize the end to end. But you might also just want to play around with some digital technology pilots to try out a technology and see what works in an existing process before you might think about applying it to a new process. But actually, if you're fortunate and can start from scratch, or you can set up a sort of part of your business, which many of the larger organisations seem to be doing, sometimes it's just easier to start with a clean sheet of paper and develop that new business model, a bit like HP did with the Instant Ink. Um, so that and for a period, you may run your new business model alongside your existing quite often in a separate business unit. But if you're a startup, you, you've got an advantage. You can leapfrog some of the current competition as you put these principles into play from the get go. So most importantly, um, this is a bit of a vision, but how we were going to get there. And I know firms of today, you need solutions now. Um, as well as thinking about how you make sure that your business is on the right trajectory to the future. So first and foremost, I direct you to an, ex an, ex an excellent resource base that um, exists. It's called the Supply Chain Resilience Hub. Um, it's got over 10 years worth of resources um, that actually will help you to improve the resilience, the productivity, and to a certain extent, the sustainability of your supply chains. Um, there's things there that are success stories. There's a number of diagnostic tools that will actually help you assess your readiness, be it for industry four or your supply chain digital readiness, or actually your ability to dock into one of those distributed manufacturing networks. Um, in all of these diagnostic tools, we'll give you a sort of self-evaluation report and so um, whilst they don't give you the answer, they will certainly help your business start their discussion. And if you need any help interpreting the results, then please do reach out either to WMG and the team there or to myself at Loughborough, because um, I know these things well, because whilst I'm not there anymore, I did help to lead their development. The second thing that you can all do um, is another made smarter innovation investment is the digital supply chain hub. They had their official launch yesterday, but they're about to launch a competition for funding on the 3rd of July. Um, it is targeted specifically at this area, so please do register your interest and look to see whether or not there's something you can do in this space. If you need connecting with people to help you, um, then please do again reach out to us through Interact because we may be able to help be able to connect you either directly or connect you via the KTN to people that could help you put together a bid. But this is a real opportunity to get some money to get going. 
And then last but not least, and this is perhaps my selfish plea, um, what we would like to do through the Interact project, um, Francis, myself, in conjunction with Charlotte and the team at Make UK and Delma and the team at Midlands Engine, we want to work together to create that future that we want. We want to understand what the digital future of manufacturing could look like. And we want to deliver that digital future together. And so phase one of our project that Francis um, is busily working on is actually helping us to de deliver by the end of this year um, the scenarios, um, business models and ecosystems designs that we think the future could look like. It won't be singular because, you know, one size doesn't fit all. The first way you could help is actually to be sign up and be part of either our expert interviews or our interactive workshops that will be running in quarter three, or qu quarter three, quarter four of this year to bring those um, scenarios together. And we'll give you some details in a moment of what you can do to sign up. But please, please, please be part of our be, start the interactions, be part of this. The second thing in year two is what we're then going to do. And so if you're in the Midlands Engine region, please also join up now. But if you're in another region, join up too, because what we're then going to do is take that generic stuff from year one and use it to work with key stakeholders in the Midlands Engine region to develop a blueprint for the Midlands Engine. So what could the future of manufacturing look like, the digital future of manufacturing look like for Midlands? And one of the issues that we see is there's too many competing views. All these different stakeholders want to have the view that's more definitive or want the money from Bayes or, or want the money for their institution. That is what's stopping us moving forward. It's easy for me to say because I'm an academic, I don't necessarily need that money. Come on, guys, unless we, um, and that's a gender neutral guys, unless we work together, unless we align, we will never get there. We have to stop competing. We have to work together. And what we intend to do is develop that blueprint for the Midlands engine, but develop it into a methodology that could be picked up by any other region in the UK or beyond. And then what we're looking for in year three is some manufacturing ecosystems, so some focal firms and their supply chain that are willing to try to put that blueprint into practice. It will be baby steps, what we can do in a year, but we want to support you on that journey. And you know, you can identify yourself now if you think you could be one of those firms. Um, and if that's so, it'd be really nice for you to be part of that journey through all three phases. But what I can't stress enough, and I suppose this is the thing that I've been reflecting on, we have to stop competing with each other. We have to stop having competing reports, competing ideas, competing for money from Bayes, and actually join together. And I'd encourage every region to do this, first as regions and then as a country, because this is the only way that we are going to be able to move forward and create that digital future that we want. And if you want to be part of our digital future, if you want to be part of Interact and the digital future manufacturing ecosystems, in the first instance, then please do reach out to, to Francis. Thank you. Jan, Francis Delma, thank you ever so much. Um, you didn't let me down. I promised um, our audience three brilliant speakers and they were certainly thought provoking presentations. So um, over to our audience, I can see that there's a couple of questions that we'll pick up first, um, but we'd then like to hear if you've got any thoughts, views, how do you want to um, interact with what the team have outlined? So Francis, I think probably the first question is for you, just reflecting on your last slide. Do you think those five things um, that you sort of highlighted uh, apply to all of the UK or are they just relevant to the Midlands region? Yes, um, so from my um, point of view, I think the five points I highlighted at the end of my um, presentation actually applies to the whole UK. Um, just a quick recap. The first point I um, highlighted was about how can we make more um, in the region in order to in improve the productivity and the sustainability of the region. It's not just the Midlands region, but also the other regions. So actually yesterday I did an expert interviews for our new project, the future, the digital future of manufacturing ecosystems. So the first question I asked the expert was, um, what was what's the desired future for the UK in 2040? Actually, he raised a very interesting um, point that the UK should be catching up in terms of the productivity to, to our um, European neighbors. So by 2040, he expected to see that the productivity of the entire UK manufacturing um, be improved to in order to catch up with the with other countries. So I do believe 
um, the capacity issues I um, identified from our survey because some, many companies now actually um, utilize 85% of their capacity, which is not a sustainable way going forward. So um, improving productivity and sustainability does apply to um, every single manufacturing firms, no matter the size of the firm um, in the UK. The other points relates to the supply chain issues. The firms need to think, take a more end-to-end -end supply chain perspective in order to address, address the supply chain issues, as Jen mentioned, the buffer management and other things, and also um, achieving the net zero goals, improving the sustainability of the entire supply chain um, are um, definitely critical and also apply to um, any single firms, no matter, no matter it's in the UK or other countries, because most of the firms in the world are now facing uh, quite similar issues in managing the end-to-end -end supply chains. Thank you, Francis. And then perhaps our next question, I think, is probably one for Jan. Jan, how do you think research could help um, for planning for the bad times, um, building more resilience? How do we make it more sexy? Um, because right now it feels a little bit expensive, um, as does green innovation. OK, and this, I think I can say question from Andrew as well about the average manufacturing leader. So. I think this goes back to a really poor, we've, we somehow have lost our understanding of the fundamentals of manufacturing strategy and supply chain strategy. And coming to Andrew's point about, do you need to be an academic to know that? Um, I actually think some of these concepts are fairly, they are relatively straightforward. Um, and I think they could be put into to checklists or um, approaches that could be made much more accessible to individual firms. But actually, it is about having that basic knowledge and then sticking to those simple rules. That's actually a book that was written by a, um, an MIT professor called Operation Rules, which is some simple rules for operations. We we could create, and I suppose this is where we could come together. Could we create that set of operational rules for the Midlands engine or for the UK that helps organisations know those basic ways of working? Could we create, so for instance, um, when I was at WMG, we created a massive open on, online course called Supply Chains, uh, uh, called um, How Things Get to You, Supply Chains in Practice. That's now been changed to an, um, a basically an industry facing module. It's six weeks of material that's online that everyone could access, probably for about 500 quid per person, that gives you an overview of those basic principles. But it's done in a way that uses everyday objects, not anything academic, and uses everyday examples from the press or other things that have gone wrong to make it accessible. We know it works because there's a massive open online course, over 5,000 people signed up to it. So it's how do we take existing resources like that and make them more accessible? But one of the biggest innovations I think the region could do is to invest in a regional planning hub. So this could be funded by the region, but actually um, they could decide which planning software they were going to use. But they could actually do the planning for these for the smaller organisations, for the SMEs. It's a bit like how SMEs sometimes can't afford a, a CFO, so they buy one in one day a week. It would be a bit like buying in your planning one day a week. Um, because actually planning is the glue that holds the supply chain together. And if we could have a coordinated approach to planning in the region, provide that support to the smaller companies within the region, then they get the benefit of having that capability without having to deliver it in each individual firm. And so for me, that could be one major way that we bring in, we could help bring in some of these rules, but we could really add value to the region. And um, it would start to give us a better view of how our regional supply chains work as well. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm conscious of time, so um, thank you very much, Jan, Delma uh, and Francis for our um, presentations today. Thank you to our audience for joining. But as Jan said, this is literally as lighting the touch paper. Um, and, you know, Jan's outlined some fantastic tools, some funding that you can get your networks or your business um, involved in. But that comes at a small fee um, and ask that you do get involved with those expert interviews from whatever walk of life you're in, a trade association, um, whether it be a LEP, combined authority, um, and essentially those business leaders, we really do need industry to interact um, on this programme and then later on in the year we look forward to you joining those interactive workshops so thank you for our speakers today and for sparing an hour of your time and the slides and the recording of this session will be circulated afterwards but enjoy the rest of your day thank you all